All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we're here to talk to, about, talk to you about the overuse of finger stick blood glucose testing. Now, despite diabetes being a very prevalent disease, this is a novel uh, project. Um, as Rena mentioned, our project it was med and grad student designed and driven, and we are, again, honored to share it with you all today. So Rena gave us a wonderful introduction, so you now know who we all are, but I wanted to give you a bit of an introduction to Sinai Student for High Value Care Initiative. It is a student-led organization dedicated to improving value and decreasing cost of care for patients. So all the members of our, of our organization form collaborative teams that strive to identify sources of low value care and implement creative interventions to decrease overuse in the hospital. So alongside that, students are provided with a curriculum to, uh, to be taught the basic tenets of high value care and quality improvement. All groups also receive institutional support and direct mentorship, in addition to institutional support for data gathering, processing, and academic work help. Disclosures, uh, we have none to disclose. Now objectives, just to give you an overview of what our goals are for this presentation, they're twofold. The first is to spread awareness of the challenges of frequent blood glucose monitoring in hospitalized patients with type two diabetes, including the financial cost and time burden for unit-based staff. Secondly is to describe a successful student designed and student led project to understand attitudes and behaviors about finger stick blood glucose testing in diabetic patients at low risk for hyperglycemia. So what you should expect over the course of our presentation here, first we'll describe the problem, why it's important for us to be looking at this, the background for some context, uh, the various impacts and implications, as well as our, um, as our proposed solution. So to set the scene here, we wanted to introduce you to someone very near and dear to our hearts. This is Granny Sue. She is a 75 year old with type two diabetes, though it's very well controlled with diet and metformin, which means that at home she's not using insulin and also is not requiring finger sticks. But one day Granny Sue is admitted to the hospital for the flu. And as hospital protocol dictates, she's taken off metformin and put on sliding scale insulin. And this of course means that she then must have her blood glucose tested via finger stick four times a day. But after a few days of this, her care team can see at, with this uh, green line here that her blood sugars are staying pretty consistent. And she's actually only ever given one unit of insulin. So you go to visit her on your morning rounds and our Granny Sue only has one complaint. My fingers are killing me. Why are they sticking me so much at this hospital? Even flipping through her book as she sits in her hospital bed has become pretty painful for her. Now, we live in a world where we're used to endless data at our fingertips. And of course, keeping tabs on patients um, is important. After all, doctors use this valuable data to make important judgment calls about medical care. But when we look at the example of Granny Sue, it begs the question, if data generated from testing isn't changing care management, why are we still testing? And we looked further into this problem and this question specifically, and we realized that there really wasn't an answer to this question and not much, much research on the subject of unnecessary finger stick usage, let alone the financial implications and the medical implications. And the truth is we really didn't know how big this problem could be and what the impact is on provider behavior, workflow, time management. And while a few finger sticks saved here and there may sound minuscule, this is actually, it proved to be a massive opportunity for consolidation, improved efficiency. And a big part of that has to do with the large diabetic population in the hospital. So let's talk about why this problem is so important. Here's a heat map showing the prevalence of adults in the United States diagnosed with diabetes uh, starting in 1998. Over time, we see that this prevalence continues to increase, increase, and increase to the point where in 2017, there were 30 million patients in the US diagnosed with uh, diabetes or who had diabetes. This is 10%, almost 10% of the US population. Of this 30 million, 7.2 million were hospitalized, around 90% had type two diabetes. And specifically at Mount Sinai Hospital on the, uh, medicine service unit, there are around 100 
and 80 patients. Typically around 35% will have diabetes, giving us 63 patients on the medicine service unit with diabetes. And going back to what Maddie said about the protocol, if each of these patients is given four finger sticks per day, that gives us a total of 252 finger sticks a day. The issue of extraneous finger stick blood glucose testing for low risk patients affects a variety of stakeholders in the hospital, directly from the patient to the nurses and physician providers. For patients, ordinary finger sticking can be a painful experience, not least when that testing does not change care management. This practice can also contribute to what is often an already stressful healthcare experience. Also, the momentary stick can also be, can be a trigger for delirium. While finger sticking looks like a straightforward and simple task, it is actually an 11 to 12 step process that takes around five minutes. This time adds up and can often be spent attending to the other many responsibilities nurses may have. Additionally, certain patients require contact precautions and this adds additional time when going in and out of patient rooms. In order to better understand how finger stick blood glucose plays out for nurses at Mount Sinai Hospital, we conducted a nurse perception study. We gave a five question multiple choice test on the extent of finger stick blood glucose and workload in doing that testing. We did this in fall 2019 on floor nine and 10 West, two of our bu busiest medicine units. What we, found, what we found is that a majority of nurses estimated it takes between four to six minutes to administer one finger stick blood glucose test. Five minutes for say 70 patient adds to about six hours a day just spent on finger sticks. At Mount Sinai Hospital, we have a common goal of providing high value care for patients. So reducing unnecessary finger stick blood glucose aligns with that goal, AKA, sad patients equals sad physicians. Additionally, in the course of navigating through many EPIC notifications, something that affects clinical management might be missed. Therefore, an ancillary benefit of reducing finger stick blood glucose is the uh, less notifications. Given the clear impact of this practice on patients, nurses, and clinician providers, we wanted to ask how often are providers aware of which patients have finger, active finger stick blood glucose testing orders. For our, point prevalence study, for our point prevalence study, which we modeled on a study by Sanjay Saint at Michigan, on a single day, we reviewed the EMR for all patients on the internal medicine teaching service for who was receiving finger stick blood glucose monitoring. For our provider awareness study, we handed out paper surveys to every intern, resident, and attending working that day and asked each provider to identify which patients had active finger stick blood glucose orders in the last 24 hours without looking at the EMR. Again, we did the study in November of 2020. What this graph demonstrates is the provider awareness of patients on point of contact glucose testing. The dark blue shows percentage of providers who underestimated, the medium light blue who estimated correctly, and the pink who overestimated the correct number of patients. There are a few notable observations. One, increasing, the, increasing levels of training tracks with decreasing level of awareness of finger stick blood glucose orders. Across all training levels, providers underestimated the number of their patients receiving finger stick blood glucose testing. Finally, few providers were aware of the exact number of patients on finger stick blood glucose testing. We felt it was necessary to identify if awareness of finger stick blood glucose ordering was low, as providers may not recognize how this order affects other frontline workers such as nurses or patients. These finger sticks can have a significant financial impact as well. Patients with diabetes comprise a significant proportion of hospitalizations in the United States. And at the Mount Sinai Inpatient Medicine Service, roughly 180 patients are seen per day, 63 of which have diabetes. And as mentioned earlier, per Sinai protocol, these 63 patients are receiving four finger sticks per day, for a total of 252 finger sticks. Of these 63 patients with diabetes, our preliminary results show that 25 to 50%, which corresponds to 16 to 32 patients, are actually low risk and ultimately receive less than five units of insulin per day. 
And if we go with that more conservative estimate, that means that 16 patients are receiving four finger sticks per day that they may not necessarily need, leading to an excess of 64 finger sticks per day. In 2020, the cost of materials was roughly $9 per finger stick. That means that those excess 64 finger sticks are costing $576 in materials per day, which adds to $17,280 per month, which leads to $27,000 in material costs per year for potentially unnecessary finger sticks. In regards to nursing time, our survey results estimated that each finger stick takes approximately five minutes. And at roughly $47 per hour in nursing time, the total nursing time to administer these extra 64 finger sticks adds up to about $250 per day, which leads to $7,530 per month, which adds up to $90,000 per year. And so when we combine the material costs in nursing time, the Mount Sinai inpatient medicine service spends roughly $297,000 in potentially excessive finger sticks among low risk diabetes patient per year. We have a large opportunity to save. So what do we do about it? Here's our proposed solution. Being that this is occurring here at Mount Sinai Hospital, we have the ability to make small adjustments to our standards of inpatient care for those with type two diabetes. We work with endocrinologists to devise an intervention for low risk patients, reducing their finger sticks from four to two per day. The endocrinologists agreed that type two diabetics are defined as low risk patients if they have four of all of the following requirements. One, managing their glucose levels at home without insulin, whether through orals or diet. Two, have consistent glucose levels over several days as indicated by previous finger stick information. Three, receiving less than five units of insulin per day in the hospital. And four, are on, high risk are on no high risk medications such as steroids. Our initial idea was to reduce finger sticks through Epic order option, although our project got interrupted due to the pandemic. Thankfully, the order option was implemented this past spring to reduce patient contact. So now since the order, order is available, our new goal is to draw attention and increase traffic to this option. Here we see how to access it. Under order sets of diabetic agents, the nursing assessments tab offers glucose testing by meter. By clicking the preset frequency of four times per day, we are brought to the following tab. Epic users can click the magnifying glass for a drop down menu of various frequencies. We would encourage NPs, PAs, MDs who are caring for low risk patients as previously described to adjust the frequency to two times daily before meals. This BIDAC option, uh, patients will receive finger sticks once in the morning after fasting, which indicates as an overall control, and once before dinner as preprandial before eating, which indicates if the patient is getting enough insulin to cover what they are eating. Once Epic users select these options, this is what the page will look like. Despite this option being available, there are clearly many steps, which inhibits its practicality during shifts. Therefore, we propose a multifaceted uh, intervention to increase traffic to the EPIC option. First, we're working to make this frequency as a button option on the default view. Second, we're accompanying that with educational outreach to increase awareness of the option and increase awareness of which patients are considered low risk for the finger stick reduction. We'll be hosting educational conferences and outreach programs for trainees, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants. We'll be introducing inf educational information in the workplace, and we'll work with Epic to create a report capturing any changes made alongside REDCap to monitor any adverse events. After one year of our intervention, we predict to have an 11.7 thousand finger stick reduction increase patient comfort and satisfaction with their healthcare services here at Mount Sinai Hospital, 970 nursing hours saved for other patients in need of care, translating to over two whole weeks of nursing time, 
and saved the hospital a good amount of money, about $100,000. Thank you, MedEd, for showing interest in our study. We're hoping to bring this project to Mount Sinai Hospital in spring of 2021, and we hope you'll help us in our efforts to free the fingers. Any questions? Hey, it's Bridget. Um, thanks for sharing your really great um, project. I think um, this also kind of work, it, it flows in very nicely with a lot of other efforts going around to try to decrease burden through documentation. And also, um, Sheree Shuprakar and I have piloted on a couple of floors an initiative which got waylaid by COVID, but we were trying to have staff share what are the things like the stupid things that they do in their way, for lack of a better word, that get in the, the way of them being able to provide, you know, more higher value care, you know, more high value care at the bedside. Um, I'd be happy to work with someone from your team to try to disseminate this to the house staff. Um, we have a newsletter that goes out to the system, to all the residents, um, and any of the EPIC sites could, could take advantage of what you're doing. Um, so if you're interested, just send me an email. I'm happy to help, help, help you guys. I guess one question I have is, one of the things that's a bit tricky is how to help people remember who's in the low risk category. and. What um, what options have you guys explored to try to get that piece of knowledge more like as a just in time piece of information so people can take action on it? I think our goal was to eventually have you know similar settings such as this to have um, just chats with with this, the staff and to be able to have educational information sent out so that that's clearly written out. So that list of um, of items that make someone some someone low risk would be on all of the educational materials that we either, whether it's posters or it's educational conferences such as this. So hopefully that information gets disseminated um, via educational information. I'd like to ask if you think the indication for admission might play any role. Any other questions at this time before we move on? We have actually a couple of minutes. So I just wanted to make sure if there's something relevant, you have a chance to ask it. I can't see the full screen with the slides being shared, but if you could just um, speak up if you do. David Sacker had a question, but it's just a little bit hard to hear you, sir. Yeah, I was going to ask if the indication for admission might play any role in the fact that you have to admit Not sure if others heard, but I did not hear that question. Did you, Anne? Um, I didn't, but maybe if you're able to put it in the chat. Yes, that would be good. David, yes, maybe write that in the chat and we can we can address it. I did just also want to acknowledge, um, you know, this project really was made. Um, Bridget, you bring up a great point uh, and we would love to work with you going forward. Um, you know, I think we've debated a lot about the value of things like BPAs and trying not to contribute to alert fatigue um, and trying to figure out the best way to balance giving out this information with not interrupting workflow. Um, and I think the other hope is that even if someone, let's say, is taken off of four times a day finger stick um, and put on twice a day, that if there is some sort of lack of control related to either hyper, hopefully not hypoglycemia, that uh, we're still seeing it since they'll still have a serum blood glucose and then still the twice a day finger sticks. Um, I did just also want to add, so this project really was made possible by um, working very closely with endocrinology and our other faculty mentor, uh, Grenny O'Malley, who is from the Division of Endocrinology. So we're really grateful for that collaboration. And I see Dr. Sacker's question in there. He says, could indication for admission play a role in risk stratification like infection with high fever? Um, do you mean in terms of uh, patients who would be high risk if they became hyperglycemic? I think that's what he's wondering, meaning this idea. Yeah, of, yeah. yeah I think. That's a great thought. Our hope is really that this is something that would not be done necessarily right on admission because you'd want to really make sure that person had controlled finger sticks in the first, let's say, two to three days of hospital stay. Um, and so if somebody had very uncontrolled blood glucoses, then they probably wouldn't be a candidate for this type of intervention. Um, so it will be up to the teams in terms of 
uh, reducing the finger sticks and really meant just for patients who are having consistently normal finger sticks. Great. Well, thank you, team. There might be some more questions that emerge uh, at the end. Thank you and congratulations. Our next presenter is Kenneth Leung. Is a, he's a recent graduate of the Mount Sinai Neurology Residency and is currently completing a fellowship in neuromuscular medicine at Stanford University. He has a strong interest in medical education and plans to pursue a career as an academic clinician educator. Welcome, Kenneth. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, can everybody see the slides? Yes. Yep. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so as you uh, mentioned, uh, I'm a recent graduate of the neurology residency. And so it's really nice to uh, get a chance to see a lot of familiar faces here. Um, hope everybody's staying safe. And, um, you know, if anything as good has come out of pandemic, I think that um, it might be the advent of telehealth and Zoom meetings. And so uh, without this, uh, I wouldn't be able to present here today from across the country. Uh, so thank you for having me today. Um, what I wanted to present today was uh, one of the medical education projects that I worked on uh, when I was a resident. Um, this project is titled, A Picture is Worth a Thousand Words in Novell Neuroimaging Education Curriculum. I don't have any uh, disclosures for this presentation. And the objectives of uh, this presentation is really to understand the role of neuroimaging uh, in the medical education, uh, in medical student education during the neurology clerkship, and also to discuss some strategies for integrated and active learning. A little bit of background. Um, neurology has, um, uh, the way I think about neurology is that it's a really uh, traditional specialty in which we focus a lot on the history and the physical exam to really guide us in terms of our clinical decision making. And outside of this, um, we have a little bit of a limited toolbox uh, beyond which we can make recommendations. Um, there are some things like lumbar punctures, EEGs, um, and neuroimaging. And so um, neuroimaging has been one thing that has really advanced over the past several decades. Um, and as such, it's been an increasingly routine and essential tool in the evaluation of patients with neurologic disorders. Um, and you can see that in that, you know, uh, one study in particular looked at uh, ED utilization rates of neuroimaging over the past uh, several years, 1994 to 2015. And they found that um, these utilization rates increased by about 500% for CT scans of the head and about 1500% for MRI scans of the brain for every thousand ED visits. Um, if you were to rotate with us on our neurology services, I think one thing that you would notice is that um, for each of our services, we tend to have something called neuroradiology rounds. And this has been really been incorporated into our daily schedule for all of our inpatient neurology services, including our stroke, general, and consult services. And very rarely do you actually see a patient on the neurology services that doesn't have any neuroimaging to review. And so uh, neuroimaging has really been recognized as an important part of uh, neurology and also as uh, medical education for medical students uh, undergoing the clerkship. Uh, the AAMC uh, has published clinical practice recommendations, um, including the ability to select, justify, and interpret clinical tests and imaging as a foundational competency for medical students. Um, and one of the big uh, neurology societies, the American Academy of Neurology, the AAN uh, has published core curriculum guidelines uh, with an analytical skills objective for medical students and required clinical neurology experiences uh, in which um, uh, they work on explaining the indication, potential complications, and interpretation of common tests uh, uh, used in diagnosing neurologic disease. And so, uh, uh, in our experience, uh, medical students get some brief exposure to neuroimaging during their non-clinical years. And a lot of this is in the setting of looking at static images, in the setting of uh, learning about particular uh, neurologic conditions such as stroke or looking at tumors, um, but they don't get a whole lot of significant formal teaching on things like the basic science and the foundational concepts of neuroimaging, about things like indications for when to order appropriate neuroimaging modalities. Uh, the fundamentals of interpreting neuroimaging, as well as how to clinically correlate whatever they see 
onto their patients in the wards. Um, and so one of my own inspirations for this project uh, was when I was a PGY3 neurology resident working at Elmhurst, we spent a lot of time um, going through scans and teaching neuroimaging to, a lot, to our medical students. Um, and so I wanted to make this a part of our neurology curriculum. So I know what you guys are all thinking. Why is this neurologist presenting an EKG on a neuroimaging uh, uh, Grand Rounds presentation? Um, and, you know, I almost didn't include this slide on here, actually. Um, I decided to include this here because I was thinking back to when I was a medical student, um, in particular, when I was on the internal medicine and ED rotations, um, a lot of my preceptors would tell me to, whenever we got an EKG for one of our patients, they would say to fold over that top part of that paper so that you don't see that interpretation anymore. And so you can just take a look at that EKG itself. And I thought that this was a really great way to really force us to really understand what we're looking at, uh, looking at the limb leads and the precordial leads and uh, what does it mean in the setting of our, our patient that we have in front of us. Um, and so I think if you've been looking at this EKG, you might uh, imagine that that interpretation might say that, hey, you know, in these limb leads here, there's a couple of ST elevations and maybe also in some of the anterior lateral precordial leads. So it might say something like this patient might have a STEMI. Um, but if you were to take a little bit of a closer look, you might notice that in the AVR uh, lead, there's actually quite a tall R wave peak. Um, and so that gives a little bit of a hint of what might actually be going on. So this, uh, this EKG was actually um, a case report that was published. And what ended up happening was that this particular patient, uh, when they were getting their EKG done, their, uh, a couple of the wires had been uh, loose and they had been reattached in the wrong position. And so you can see that right here, actually. Um, two of the precordial and two of the limb leads had been reattached in the opposite um, uh, uh, area, opposite, opposite place. And so when they repeated the EKG, that's what they saw. This is the, uh, the actual EKG recording. And I think that uh, you know, this whole concept really brings light to the importance of really looking at our own studies and understanding what's going on uh, without really just relying on the automated interpretation that that EKG machine gives you. Um, and really, you know, being able to identify when something doesn't quite look right. You know, we still look at EKGs and telemetry every once in a while, particularly when we're on our neurology stroke rotation. Um, but by far the most common test uh, in neurology uh, is that we take a look at is neuroimaging. And so I just kind of put out a couple of the common uh, types of imaging modalities and sequences that we take a look at, including CT and MRI sequences. Um, you know, for a neurologist who sees multiple scans every single day, I think that this can be very routine. And, um, but from, a, from the point of view of a practitioner who doesn't routinely look at these scans all the day, or even as a medical student, when you're just tr first trying to understand exactly what you're taking a look at, it can be a very daunting task. Um, there's a lot of uh, both neurology and neuroanatomy that you have to understand. You have to understand the basics of exactly what type of scan you're even looking at. Um, you need to understand um, some of the subtle findings that you really have to take a look out for and exactly what it means for your patient. And so just taking a look at these scans right now, you might have noticed that uh, the top left scan is a CT scan and there's actually an evidence of a subdural hemorrhage there. And then the bottom left scan is a diffusion weighted imaging scan with some diffusion restriction. And so that, uh, and uh, as well as the ADC scan to the right of that might make you think of a stroke. And so in thinking about how we can best uh, teach neuroimaging to medical students, uh, I first wanted to get a better sense of exactly what experiences your uh, medical students had already. And so we did a needs assessment in which we assessed, um, in which 58 uh, medical students responded to our survey. Uh, you can see that it's a smattering of uh, medical students across three different years, uh, second, third, and fourth year uh, medical students. About half of them haven't done neur the neurology clerkship yet, um, but the other half um, was, uh, has had experiences across different sites um, during the neurology clerkship from Mount Sinai to Elmhurst to the VA and also on the stroke general and consult services. Um, we asked them prior to their third year what their exposure to neuroimaging has been. And for the most part, the vast majority um, didn't have any other experience other than brain and behavior. 
a couple of uh, students had had neurology shadowing already, and a couple had also had radiology shadowing. I think one person in particular also had some uh, radiology or neuroimaging research. And so uh, what we wanted to do was we asked them how competent did they feel ordering neuroimaging studies, um, and also how competent did they feel evaluating and interpreting neuroimaging when they did see it. And I think you can see here that for most uh, students, um, you know, they felt like they could do, use a, get a little bit more help. They didn't quite feel um, uh, as competent as they would like to. Um, and we also wanted to take a look at, um, in terms of designing a neuroimaging curriculum for medical students, which uh, teaching modalities might be the, um, might be the most uh, efficient or the best for them. And so we included a couple of different options here, including didactic sessions, interactive review with residents, case-based online modules, suggested readings, cadaver labs, and also a stroke simulation. Um, and I think that um, in, in, in this particular slide, green uh, is, uh, they didn't feel like this instruction would really benefit them at all. Whereas orange would be, they felt like it would benefit them extremely. And so I think uh, the overall pattern that we saw was that interactive review with residents and stroke simulations were really popular. Um, and, you know, students kind of shied away from things like suggested reading, whereas didactics, online modules, and cadaver labs were kind of in the middle. And lastly, we also asked them, um, what do you think that you would have been better prepared if you had additional neuroimaging teaching during your first two years? And which is this graph here on the left. And, and also whether or not you think you would benefit from additional neuroimaging teaching during their neurology clerkship. And I think the vast majority of students said that uh, they would like uh, additional neuroimaging teaching both during the first two years and during their neurology clerkship. I wanted to include some uh, specific quotes from some students during this needs assessment because I think it really reflects um, a lot of things that you can't quite get from all of these graphs. Um, there has been no coverage of neuroimaging in years one and two. I don't know the difference between T1 and T2 MRI. And when contrast is used, I'm never sure what to expect. I think the most helpful thing is to sit down with someone and directly compare the different images from different modalities. Ask us what we see and make us answer. Learn by doing. Written cases are often very long and boring and sometimes the thing you're supposed to see isn't even labeled. To really learn, you need someone to go through a case one-on-one -on -one and ask all the elementary slash stupid questions. And Often during our small groups, there can be a lot of confusion with the only explanation being, oh, that's something that you see on imaging and you'll learn that eventually. It should be done as early as possible, preferentially during the first year. And so, um, you know, the goals of, of uh, building a neuroimaging curriculum for medical students for us was one, to build a foundation by understanding basic concepts of neuroimaging. We wanted to create interactive learning experiences and we also wanted to introduce this formal curriculum that was integrated into the neurology clerkship. And so uh, what did we do? We recruited third year medical students as they took part in their four week uh, neurology clerkship. And this was done during the 2019 to 2020 academic year. Um, we were granted, granted exemption status from the IRB. And our neuroimaging curriculum included uh, a lot of different aspects. Uh, one of which was a pre and a post test assessing their knowledge and comfort levels just so that we can see how everybody was doing. And um, we also included uh, a resident-led neuroimaging foundation uh, lecture for them, a neuroimaging worksheet that they can take with them uh, on the wards um, and fill out as they were taking a look at their own scans of their own patients. Um, we included an interactive review of uh, their own cases with the residents, um, a stroke code simulation, which is something that had been also uh, ongoing even before this, uh, but basically where a, a student would go through a simulation of a patient undergoing an acute stroke code and um, uh, really teaching them how to the process of going through that and, and also looking at some acute uh, neuroimaging in the process of that as well. Uh, and, and in addition to online case-based modules. This is an example of some of the pre and the post-test questions that we used. Um, and you know, I think the main thing I wanted to show here was that we wanted to assess um, different types of questions um, as, uh, and addressing different uh, 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 concepts that we wanted to impress on the students during their neuroimaging curriculum. And so you can see here the top left question is a question 
asking about what type of neuroimaging that they would order in a particular clinical scenario. The top right is just identifying what are they, what type of sequence or what type of imaging they're even looking at. The bottom left is looking at just some basic anatomy uh, 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 in a neuroimaging study. And the bottom right is um, uh, students were given a, a, a common uh, uh, neuroimaging, a CT angiogram, um, and they had to kind of correlate that with the clinical scenario and understand exactly what's going on. After their uh, didactics, they were also given a neuroimaging quick review sheet, uh, which basically just summarized all the important concepts that were given. Uh, and this way, a student would be able to carry this with them in their white code. And whenever they ended up looking at a, a scan, they can use this to kind of review uh, what are the things that may, they may want to look for and how do I identify what I'm looking at exactly. Um, we gave students a neuroimaging worksheet. Um, and you know, the idea for this really came from when I was a medical student as well. Um, uh, a lot of times you, you may see medical students walking around with a clipboard and little scut sheets where they have spaces to fill out the HPI, past medical, family, and social history. And so I wanted to try to do something similar with the neuroimaging curriculum where students can take a look at their imaging and write down what they see first before looking at the radiologist interpretation. Um, they would review their imaging individually. And then after they're done with that, they would take a look at the radiology read and see what they wrote and compare what they saw with the radiologist. And then after that, they would review the images with their own resident and fellow, having, having that clinical context uh, in mind and having had already seen the patient and examined them. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, we also had a stroke code simulation as part of our curriculum. And this was held in the Mount Sinai Star Center or Simulation Teaching and Research Center. And what happened in these uh, sessions was that stroke fellows would lead uh, groups of students through two particular cases, one of which was a large vessel acute ischemic stroke that required TPA and thrombectomy. And another case that was a hemorrhagic stroke that was complicated by seizures. Um, and in this particular simulation session, uh, students would in real time have to identify and triage their clinical syndromes. Um, they would have to interpret the CT and CTA, uh, CT angiogram images. And then based on what they saw, they would try to formulate a, a treatment plan. So here are some results. And one of the, some of the things that we really wanted to focus on was whether or not this curriculum was helpful for students in terms of uh, addressing their comfort levels with looking at neuroimaging, as well as their knowledge and also what aspects of the curriculum was most effective. And so um, in our study, uh, 60 students ultimately completed the pre and the post test uh, from uh, July 1st in 2019 to February in 2020. And unfortunately, uh, the study had to be stopped a little bit early because clerkships were canceled in the setting of uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but from the data that we uh, did have, um, we found that about 86% of patients and or 86% of medical students, sorry, uh, did look at their patient scans uh, every time or almost every time. About 58% reviewed their patient scans with a resident every time or almost every time. And when we asked them what type of curricular intervention students most benefited from, um, I think that the winners here were really the resident-led didactic session, as well as the stroke simulation. And they really enjoyed that. Um, a little bit lower were the interactive review with residents and case-based online modules. And then again, uh, students didn't really enjoy just kind of having suggested reading materials that they could read on their own. We also wanted to take a look at uh, students' comfort levels with both choosing imaging and then as well as interpreting CT scans and MRI scans. Um, and so these, are, these correlate with these different rows here on this graph. And we asked them their comfort levels both before and after uh, the neuroimaging curriculum. And I think that um, what you can see here was that um, before the curriculum, uh, their comfort levels were kind of in the range of 10 to 26% um, uh, were either moderately to extremely comfortable. Um, afterwards, there was a, a pretty nice uh, uh, rise in, in the amount of comfort levels from 65% to 90%. Uh, and this result was statistically significant. Um, I think another uh, revealing uh, uh, question that we asked them was that 80% of students ended up saying that, uh, that they were either moderately to extremely more likely to look at their own patient's imaging or other tests rather than relying just solely on written reports as a result of this curriculum. Um, and lastly, 
uh, we also wanted to take a look at students' knowledge. Uh, so that pre and the post test that we administered uh, were just a set of 10 questions. And so uh, students could have a score of anywhere from zero to 10. And again, these questions were on different aspects of neuroimaging from ordering tests to identifying the type of tests they were looking at to anatomy and also to clinical correlation. And so the mean assessment scores uh, on the pretest was about 4.88. Uh, before the curriculum and after the curriculum, this rose up to 7.18, and this was, a, again, a statistically significant uh, improvement. Um, and so overall, I think that um, students really enjoyed the curriculum and um, did improve in terms of their comfort levels and knowledge levels, but the curriculum itself wasn't without its own challenges. And a lot of this came in, in as we were thinking about the design of how we would want to teach uh, medical students about neuroimaging. Um, one of the things that I realized is that not all students will eventually want to go into neurology as, as much as I would love them to. Uh, and so one of the questions we had to ask was, how do we really tailor our educational curriculum so that it's really most beneficial for everyone, even if you don't go into neurology in the future? And I think that one, one of the things that we realize is that um, there's, a, there's a benefit to being able to understand exactly how a neurologist thinks and goes through a particular study. And even if you don't eventually go into neurology, um, there are often times where, whether or not you're working in the hospital or in the outpatient clinic, you'll have to be able to identify when a patient has uh, a neurologic condition that has to be evaluated. And also when you're referring to a neurology uh, provider, what type of tests that they might wanna see uh, before uh, they get seen. And so this is where I think uh, uh, some of the benefits of this uh, uh, neuroimaging curriculum uh, uh, would be helpful for, for students. Um, we also realize that medical students are very busy. Uh, their time is limited. Um, and between trying to uh, get used to a brand new clinical environment every four weeks during their clerkships and then going home and then having to study uh, for the shelf exams, they don't have a lot of time uh, uh, that's free. And so we really wanted to create a high yield learning activity that was really impactful without adding a whole lot of additional scut work. And a part of that addressing this particular challenge was really trying to see which of these um, teaching modalities and inter interventions helped them the most. And lastly, um, I just wanted to uh, recognize that, you know, neurology is hard and, and that's coming from a neurologist. Um, there's a lot of neuroanatomy that's involved and when you're taking a look at images in particular, you also have to understand a lot of neuroradiology and clinical neurology as well. Um, and so it's not easy, um, particularly when you're at the medical student level. I think in summary though, um, based on everything that we've done and some of the responses that we've gotten from the medical students, uh, we, uh, there are a couple of uh, um, conclusions that we could draw. Um, students overall felt that neuroimaging was an important part of their neurology clerkship and should be taught earlier. Students prefer resident and fellow-led interactive learning activities over other ones. And also that designing a neuroimaging curriculum built into the neurology clerkship is, a challenging, is challenging, but can result in significant improvements in comfort levels and knowledge. And so before I end, I just wanted to give a quick thank you to some of the people who helped me design this um, uh, curriculum and uh, go through this project. Um, uh, this project was uh, something that I went through as, uh, uh, as part of the Harvard Macy uh, Clinical Educator Program as well. And I wanted to thank Dr. Soriana, who is one of my small group uh, mentors. Um, I also wanted to thank Helen Chung, who's one of my co-residents who helped really bounce ideas back and forth, as well as Michelle Fabian and Laura Stein, who at the time when I was a resident were the courtship uh, directors, but they're currently actually the residency uh, program directors as well. And lastly, I wanted to thank the Institute for Medical Education for giving me the opportunity to present this project. Uh, thank you very much. I'd be glad to help answer your questions. Thank you so much, Kenneth. We'll ask you, to, perfect, that's great. So folks, I, I can see you on the screen. If you have questions for Kenneth, please uh, raise your hand so we can ask him questions. Thank you so much for presenting, Kenneth. Uh, David, go ahead. I, I You're just, muted. I, I just couldn't help wonder, wondering how close the concordance was on paired analysis between an individual student's comfort level and her or his actual knowledge level. How, how well did the students assess their own knowledge levels individually, 
not just as a group. Yeah, I think that um, in terms of concordance between comfort levels and knowledge levels, um, I didn't get a chance to take a look at individual students' answers, but I think in general, what you might expect is that as people, as students gain more knowledge about looking at these images, as they spent more time taking a look at them and reviewing them and comparing them with their patients, they probably also felt more comfortable and then uh, as well. And so that's what I would expect uh, if I were to take a look at individual student responses. Good. As long as there's no dunning effect. <laughs> yeah. I think it would be a little bit atypical if someone felt more comfortable, but kind of learned less as a result of that. Yeah. Other questions for Kenneth? Carrie, go ahead. Hi, hi, Kenneth. Um, I'm Kira Yurich, one of the psychiatrists. Um, I think Dr. Holstein, who's on, and I have run Brain and Behavior, which is the second year neuroscience class. And, and one of the things I was very interested to see, so we spend quite a lot of time doing neuroradiology teaching in the course with the neuroradiologists and with um, a lot of integration of the material with other material and, and test questions. So I thought it was interesting, the students' perception that they didn't learn any neuroradiology in the first two years. So I'm wondering what you thought about that and also whether you've thought about, you know, how you might build a stepwise curriculum. Like what, you know, what are sort of the appropriate learning goals for neuroradiology in years one and two and how could the clerkship build on them, um, you know, in a coordinated way? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that great question. Um, you know, I don't have a whole lot of, ex I wasn't a medical student here at Mount Sinai, so I don't have a whole lot of experience with exactly the different lectures that go on during the brain and behavior um, section. I think a part of um, what makes neuroimaging challenging is um, the way that uh, medical education is structured and that, you know, the first two years in general tend to be more didactic and lecture heavy, whereas the last two years tend to be more clinical heavy in the hospital. Um, and so it's really hard to be able to have um, interactive reviews with radiologists and scrolling through scans rather than just looking at those static images. Um, uh, in addition to just also understanding the basic science of them. Um, but I think, um, you know, if that might be one area that we can potentially address in terms of making st students a little bit more comfortable when they eventually transition into the hospital is look, being able to scroll through the own images themselves and, and see what's going on. Um, yeah, I don't have a great answer in terms of um, why students' perceptions were may have, may have been a little bit different than, than the way that the uh, curriculum was dis, uh, was designed during the first two years, um, and I think that's something that we can maybe take a look at a little bit more too. And, and Ken, I may just add for a second. It's it's Laura Stein. Um, I think we could think about the back to basics. Or I don't know if it's been rebranded to something else since I've left the clerkship, but could we do some kind of back to basics with? neuroimaging specifically in the clerkship. Um, and, and perhaps we should think about, you know, the scans that they're seeing in the stroke code simulation in the didactic and see how those could link nicely with what they're seeing in brain and behavior. Hi, hi, uh, I'm uh, Nolan Kagetsu. Uh, thank you for that uh, terrific presentation. I must admit I missed some of it, but I'm a neuroradiologist myself and I'm a huge fan of actually introducing more neuroradiology um, into to the medical students and uh, and uh, would be happy to work with others uh, moving forward to perhaps uh, try to introduce it, it uh, uh, earlier earlier in the curriculum. Thank you, that's great. I would also open up the floor for other questions for our first presenting team as well. So feel free to, they are also on the call. So if you have other questions that have emerged. All right, so then I'm going to give everyone back five minutes of their hour, maybe a bio break between this and your next Zoom meeting. So I want to thank you all. I want to congratulate our Education Research Day Blue Ribbon winners for their outstanding work, and we hope they continue this great work and come back and share with us again. Uh, to encourage you to fill out your evaluation forms, Olga has put those in the link. Please, please fill those out. Um, and then to remind you that on the 27th of January, we will welcome Dr. Ivor Agard, who is Senior Associate Dean for Education at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, who will be speaking to us about time efficient and effective teaching in the clinical environment. 
So please join us then. And thank you once again for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you.